Okay, uh, good afternoon, uh, dear guests. Um, my colleague, uh, Professor Michael Wallace and myself, my name is Jaime Jacobi. Uh, we are very happy to have you all here today uh, for our last, uh, oh, sorry, it's not the last, but uh, the latest uh, post-COVID-19 uh, series of the Development Planning Unit. Uh, which today will focus on three often uncompared cases, Somaliland, Palestine, and Syria, and the way in which unrecognition from different kinds of unrecognitions affect the politics of COVID-19. Uh, I would like to invite my colleague uh, Nimo uh, to chair uh, our session today. Nimo. Thank you, Haim. Um, good afternoon, good evening, good morning, wherever you are. Thank you very much for joining us today. Um, so as my colleague Haim has said, we have three very different um, regions here that are experiencing very different forms of political unrecognition. So it'd be very interesting to hear how these states are dealing with the current pandemic um, that we're experiencing. So I would like to take this opportunity to introduce our three panelists. Um, the first uh, pan, uh, panelist is Dr. Jama Musa Jama. Uh, Dr. Jama is an ethnomathematician with a PhD in African studies, specializing in computational linguistic of African languages. He has authors and authored and edited several books. He's a current director. He's also the founder of the Hargeisa Cultural Center in Somaliland. Dr. Jama is known for his research on traditional African games and their potential for use in formal education. Um, he's a cultural activist, historical researcher, and a preserver of Somali oral histories. Dr. Jama is also the founder of the influential Hargeisa International Book Fair. Um, and in 2018, he was the host of the 13th International Congress of Somali Studies International Association in Hargeisa. So Dr. Jama Musa Jama, thank you so much and thank you for accepting our invitation to talk today. And Dr. Jama will be covering the Somaliland um, case. Our second speaker is Dr. Abdul Karim Exayez. Um, he is going to be talking about Syria, the northwestern um, part of Syria. Dr. Exayez is a Syrian medical doctor and he's also an epidemiologist. He's a research associate at King's College London working on health systems in the Middle East and northern Syria. In 2013, Dr. Ezayez was training to be a neurosurgeon um, when his residency was unfortunately interrupted by the war. Karim has worked in many field hospitals in northwestern Syria. He was the health lead for Save the Children in Syria between 2013 and 2016. He was also involved in the rebuilding of the health system in the opposition-controlled areas in, um, in Syria. He's a trustee member of two NGOs, Shafak and Refugee Trauma Initiative. He uh, did his medical training at Aleppo University, but he also uh, completed his MSc from London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. So please join me um, in welcoming Dr. Exayez um, in our to our discussions today. Our third panelist is from Gaza, and he'll be talking about the Palestine um, experience in this case. Um, Muhammad Shahada is a Palestinian writer from Gaza. He's a columnist at the Forward newspaper and also Europe's regional manager at the Euromed Human Rights Monitor. So these are our three panelists today. And we will start with uh, Dr. Jama'a Musa Jama. Um, so thank you so much, Dr. Jama. And if you can start our discussion today, that would be great. Welcome. <coughs> Thank you so much, uh, Ilhan Nimo, uh, um, and uh, thank you, uh, the organizers, for inviting us. And it's a pleasure and honor uh, to share with uh, my fellow panelists today. Uh, despite the two, as you said, the different uh, regions, uh, but I think something sharing in common because of the uh, pandemic uh, 
if it's known, it will be known this is uh, someone that put at the same level in every part and every class uh, of the society. Uh, just for the, um, uh, the sake of time, uh, I will be uh, sharing uh, uh, maybe at the end of the, of the discussion in a long paper about the issue, uh, but I will do some highlights. But uh, just for the clarification and for the sake of understanding what I'm talking about, I will use equally uh, Somaliland uh, as a oh, Somaliland Republic uh, and Federal Republic of Somalia. Sometimes I will mention as Somalia, so just for the sake of understanding uh, one, the region that I'm, 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 I'm focusing. Uh, Somaliland, uh, uh, just a brief uh, introduction for those who uh, uh, um, I see that many people are connecting uh, from uh, social media, is uh, a de facto independent state of the Horn of Africa which despite of being non-recognized and uh, recognized by any nation represent uh, peace and democracy and stability and prosperity as well as uh, cooperation in the region. Uh, it's often by the scholars who studied uh, is referred as a beacon of hope, uh, stability and democracy in an otherwise volatile Horn of Africa region. Uh, Somaliland, just to be clear, is not part of the federal government of Somalia and uh, has managed its own uh, domestic and international security affairs since 1992, when it dissolved uh, the union with the Somali Republic. And of course, uh, that uh, uh, dissolve came uh, after a war. That war uh, has left a legacy whereby uh, the health uh, and infrastructure of public facilities were destroyed. Uh, and as uh, for that also complicates uh, the COVID-19 response that's taking place at the moment. So my land is a young uh, nation of 4 million people and a coastland that stretches over 800 kilometers along the Red Sea. I'm mentioning the Red Sea because of uh, the importance, the uh, geographical importance of the Red Sea at the moment. Uh, and, and the capital, Hargeisa, is uh, a large uh, bustling metropolitan city with the population coming over one million, so almost one third of the population. And it incidentally became the third largest city on the Horn of Africa after Addis Ababa and Mogadishu. Now, what happened uh, after uh, in early January when uh, the WHO declared uh, the coronavirus as a a public health emergency uh, uh, concern, uh, everyone focused uh, in general, uh, the problem is in the early stage of the pandemic uh, to ensure effective detection and protection for um, we countries, let us say, um, in the global South and Africa. But WHO, another uh, international policy, however, uh, didn't appear to pay particular attention of what happened is when already weak healthcare system of a less developed countries like the one in Somaliland are further hampered by the non-recognition status. And that's where I will touch uh, the issue about uh, the non-recognition. Of course, a general uh, a country need a strong bilateral agreement and collaboration with the recognized counterpart if uh, effective delay, containment, and mitigation are, 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 are to be put in the place. What was making really difficult of the situation. Somaliland, of course, has open borders and open economy, and that is one of the major issues that we are discussing. It uh, borders in Djibouti, Ethiopia, Somalia, and Yemen in the north. But most importantly, it has a merchant economy that depends heavily on the global trade. Uh, COVID-19 caused havoc uh, in the global trade uh, on which Somaliland economy depends, uh, and the impact was felt even before the virus reached the country. So Somaliland suddenly found itself uh, fighting in two fronts uh, before the other countries, which was uh, a health front uh, and economic economic front. So in response to the pandemic, Somaliland government formed a national uh, preparedness and prevention committee led by the first president. So they put, uh, the government put everything that has in its place. I will touch about the challenges, but also the opportunities uh, uh, that uh, a non-recognized country such as Somaliland in the global pandemic. Let us talk uh, and start uh, first thing is first. This is uh, the time we need a strong state power that is proved in every place. So the current crisis highlights the role of the state, uh, strengthens the national boundaries uh, and sovereignty as a crucial element is, uh, in dealing with the COVID-19. So from the perspective of unrecognized state in this concept, uh, 
um, there are two aspects that uh, we have to consider. The first one is that uh, the uh, unrecognized state uh, themselves often exert power on their de facto statehood by declaring a border closure, um, just as, as, uh, as recognized ones do. Uh, in this specific case, Somaliland the government uh, was the first in the region uh, to declare the border closure in the region when the case was identified not, on, not even in Somaliland, uh, but in Ethiopia. So the government quickly deployed medical teams, teams uh, to the entry point. So the second point that uh, I think uh, should be, uh, should be uh, considered that, first of all, the, the, the decision came as a declaration of emergency by the, uh, by the, by, by the Somaliland government, uh, but it was also to anticipate and showcase uh, 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 the power uh, and showcase the state of uh, independent state. And it was more, it was, uh, of course, a genuine concern for, 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 for the government of Somaliland to the health emergency to quickly act, uh, but it was considered also a political move uh, to show that uh, it has under control it is, it is, it is territory, basically. And this is uh, 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 coming from the Somaliland British government as well, and in the past uh, 29 years. Now, uh, what happens is that uh, when you need that kind of emergency, you show and you want to, the world notices you. So that's uh, another aspect. The government uh, in unrecognized states promote their central role in the nation through legitimizing the decisions uh, and uh, requiring a public and private and international partners and stakeholders uh, to comply with the government guidelines in a way to show I'm here and I'm, I'm managing my own uh, state. So I want to, I want to, I want to do it. So that's what's uh, another aspect uh, uh, that uh, the, 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 uh, the crisis immediately showed that Somaliland came on the spot uh, showing her, 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 her evidence. This point about the internal legitimacy of the government is important and it reflects on the capability to act with the consent of the population and the general trust of confidence in the government and indeed in a formal opposition and the government shared it and, and, and wanted to work together on this in this in this in this, in this aspect. So this both aspects in Somaliland uh, uh, seems to be a little bit special uh, uh, situation to consider. First, uh, um, in the effectiveness uh, of the closure uh, of the Somaliland borders was coming, the already system that has a function and not necessarily something that started, uh, started now. Um, but uh, the, the aspect that immediately uh, became evidence is the economic aspect uh, uh, that has been challenging by the number of reasons arising uh, uh, from Somalia. The state of emergency of closure borders uh, for instance, are crippled in the state of capacity of private uh, sector activities. Consequently, for example, the taxation revenue of the Somaliland government has taken a significant hit over the past few months, as indicated by the brief uh, prepared by the Somaliland Minister of Finance. So they say that this will be, this will be. So these two uh, major issues of uh, uh, economic impact and um, state uh, show government uh, 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 showcase uh, was uh, something that immediately to, 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 to observe. Many states uh, recognized that uh, states opened the opportunity for alternative support lines and interventions through both physical monetary and policy interventions to support uh, the wider economy and the public institution. But the unrecognized states uh, uh, the contrary usually don't have that access of multilateral financial institutions and international financial system on bilateral economy. So in this case, Somaliland, it further like is well developing economic regulatory uh, institutions. But being a developing economy, the Somaliland the government capacity to let automatic economic stabilizers uh, such as welfare transfers to the poorest people was not possible, absolutely. I know that my time is going down, so I will touch briefly the issue of the humanitarian assistance, which is a, a crucial and fundamental. Somaliland as an uh, unrecognition is not a product of ongoing conflict and, and, and violence. It's a chronic state of quite de facto independence, despite not being recognized. The last conflict erupted in the 1990s, early 1990s. But what happened here? The, 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 there are two types of aid assistance. The first, uh, is to the people, mainly humanitarian aid, and the second is to the state, mainly development and budgetary support. The situation in Somaliland is that the aid 
to the people depends on the humanitarian situation. And as long as your condition is uh, allow us uh, 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 to the ground, uh, it will come, it keep coming. Not full, but it's still elements that are coming. Different uh, will be, and I conclude in hand, I see that uh, time is running, uh, is the edge the state, which, which is really challenging. And uh, when you are not to recognize it uh, because if you don't count and any aid which comes through official channels goes to that recognized entity. And uh, in several times, the Somaliland uh, government announced it, uh, that they would never accept international assistance coming through the government in Mogadishu. And this is a red line as far as the government is concerned. So what happened? Uh, all uh, the, 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 the support that could have come in these emergency cases uh, is uh, blocked because of Somaliland is not willing to accept it. And because of uh, the world has a difficult to deal with uh, with uh, uh, with with an unrecognized and 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 and, and sign an agreement, I think I will come back on the issue in a question and answer. Is because of uh, 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 I think the most important uh, thing is uh, uh, look is really paradoxically that uh, Somaliland appears in some cases is doing better. Than, 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 than the recognized countries. And that's something that I would like to touch when I come back. And the second point, uh, which is uh, fundamental, is uh, to see if there are opportunities that are coming from the coronavirus. For now, I'll stop here, but I, in, the, in, the, in the question and answer, I will be coming back and touch these two major issues that some is Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Jam'a. Um, now, if we can move on to Abdul Kad Dr. Abdul Qadir Exayez, please who will be covering the Syrian case today. So thank you, Nemo, and uh, thank you for the um, uh, UCL Development Unit for hosting this uh, event. Uh, so talking about COVID-19 as a pandemic, um, I think the way we should approach uh, the, our assessment on health system preparedness for these sorts of health threats should follow frameworks that are usually used in health, sec health security or global health security. These frameworks usually are designed to assess the short-term uh, impact of the pandemic and also the long-term preparedness. And on the, the short-term thing, we need to assess prevention, detection, and response. And in the long term, we should assess preparedness, uh, local health norms and regulations, uh, and also the um, the ability to share information widely with the with the uh, global community. So, talking about Syria, uh, when we will assess these elements in relation to health system in Syria, we need to um, recognize that there are three different health systems in the country. So, the conflict that has started in 2011 after the Syrian revolution. Uh, recently has divided the country into three main territories. Uh, in late 2018, after the Assad regime, the government of Syria, they were able to re-control large territories in the, in the country. So the country has three distinctive areas of control. The first one is central Syria and the coast, which is controlled by the government of Syria, the Assad regime, supported by the Russians, Iranians, uh, and they do have uh, other regional support from Hezbollah in Lebanon and other militias in Iraq. Uh, the other parts in northeast of Syria, which is controlled currently by the self-administration, which is uh, formed by the Syrian democratic forces that have a Kurdish nature, but they have also Arabic element, an Arabic element, and also the northwest of Syria, which is the third territory, which is under the control of oppositions with support from Turkey and other regional actors. So they, each territory, they developed their health system in different ways, and they were impacted and they responded to the COVID-19 in different ways. And the main problem here that the international community recognized only the Damascus government as the local uh, authority in, in the country, while the self-administration northeast or the opposition-controlled uh, areas in northwest are unrecognized as legitimate uh, health, uh, local authorities. And therefore, the response, for example, the humanitarian response is channeled usually through the Damascus, the, the, the government of Syria. There, there have been uh, cross-border humanitarian response in the, in the last few years, but this is under threat now 
where the UN security resolution that was uh, was uh, taken in 2014 to 165, that allowing the UN agencies and other humanitarian actors to deliver cross-border uh, humanitarian interventions into Syria, this resolution has expired last January, and it was vetoed by the Russian and the Chinese. Mm -hmm. So uh, currently, the cross-border operations are under threat. So only uh, this uh, the resolution was extended only for northwest of Syria for a period of six months that will expire in 10 days from now, in, in 10th of July. So these challenges meant Sorry, that the, the impact was um, different in the different areas of control. Talking about the um, government of Syria areas of control, so the, the first case of COVID-19 was announced in 22nd of March. Before this, there were a lot of critis, uh, criticize of, on, on, of the Syrian government that they were not sharing information transparently about the COVID-19 cases. And the, the risks on, on, on the regime held areas, the government of, of, of Syria areas, uh, was mainly because of open border policy with Lebanon and Iraq and the movements of different militias between these three countries and also the open border policy with Iran, who is one of the, uh, the main supporter for the, uh, for the government of Syria. Whereas in the northeast of Syria, the type of risks and were different. In northeast and northwest, the displacement, for example, is number one uh, uh, risk factor that puts these areas under a higher, at a higher risk of being affected by this crisis. So, in, for example, in northwest of Syria, uh, only between December 2019 and April 2020, uh, 2020, there have been more than one million people who were displaced as a result of the offensive by the government of Syria on, on northwest of Syria. So, the, uh, in talking about numbers, in the government of Syria areas of control, number of cases un until now, it's around 270. Uh, and there are more than five laboratories to detect cases. Whereas in northwest of Syria, for example, an area with more than four million population, there's only one lab. And this lab was equipped uh, only in May. So after, after a few months of the pandemic, this lab um, has been equipped using local resources. And here's the problem of engaging uh, between international community, international humanitarian assistance, and these unrecognized territories. Because for example, the WHO, who's tasked uh, by uh, supporting local health authorities to scale up and prepare for the COVID-19 response, they channel their assistance at the first place into Damascus, to the Minister of Health in Damascus. And very little or really nothing was going to the Northeast or the Northwest. And we're talking here about 3 million population at least in the Northeast and 4 million population in the Northwest. So almost half of the population of the country in residing in these areas where the government of Syria, they do not have full access to those people. So this meant that the response in Northwest and Northeast was slow and the uh, reliance of international assistance was not an option. And that's why there were more kind of innovative approaches on how to tackle these problems. Uh, for example, in northwest of Syria, and I published recently a paper on the response of COVID-19 on, on Syria in the Journal of Public Health. Uh, so it talked mainly about how the local health authorities, they try to fill the gap of a central coordination mechanism. So the, uh, the, the health cluster in Gaza and Tab uh, that or coordinate the cross-border operations in northwest of Syria, they established a task force supported by the WHO, but this task force has very limited uh, presence in the field because of the border uh, problems. So in, uh, field actors, for example, Edlib Health Directorate, the White Helmets, the Civil Defense, they established a central governance coordination mechanism and they tried to mobilize community resources to scale up the response. They established many isolation centers, community isolation centers, relying only on community uh, resources. Uh, they they uh, encouraged volunteering by communities. More than 10,000 people were volunteered to take part in this response. 
also they they uh, were able to utilize diaspora medical networks so they used digital solutions to um to to uh, utilize a medical diaspora in europe and syrian medical doctors in europe or in the us and elsewhere and uh, for example other digital solutions that they they uh, recruited um, like some solutions for self-assessment for example a website was developed to uh, to to provide self-assessment service for people while this service was really this what this happened in mid-march while other for example the the, the uphill uh, version of the self-assessment website in the us was launched only late march so these kind of um, innovative approach in the uh, during the early stages of the pandemic um, could be you know first because of available resources but also could be because of this status of unrecognition because they feel that we are unrecognized by the international community so we need to rely on our own resources to scale up the uh, the response so I will maybe stop here to allow uh, our colleague uh, Muhammad from Gaza to uh, talk about the experience of Gaza, but I'm happy to expand on various points during the q and a Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Karim. Um, now, if we can move on to Mohammed Shahada, who will be talking about the Palestinian case. Thank you, Mohammed. Hi, everyone. Um, I, I will try to make my presentation as much comprehensive as possible about the entire territory, although it's now known that it's demographically and politically uh, disconnected by virtues of Israel's occupation. Uh, with Israel's looming annexation, it's often said that uh, it would bring about one state with two systems. However, I think the coronavirus has shown rather six systems that already exist in place. For instance, the first system is for Jewish Israelis and settlers who were fully covered by all measures undertaken by the Israeli government uh, to combat the virus. Whereas the second system for Israeli Arabs, they were at the front line of combating the virus as they make up to 17% of the country's doctors. However, they were treated as second class citizens in government measures. For instance, Israel began to set up uh, drive-by testing zones uh, for Corona, but only in Jewish areas, not in Arab communities to make sure the intended results would follow Israel announced this information only in Hebrew, not Arabic. Similarly, government applications for unemployment benefits and municipal tax breaks during Corona were not available in Arabic. In the occupied territories, the matter is indeed far worse. Uh, the fourth, uh, third and fourth systems are basically Palestinians in East Jerusalem and the West Bank Area C, respectively. Uh, in both areas, they are fully controlled uh, civil and security control by Israel and the Palestinian Authority is not allowed to operate. While people in East Jerusalem enjoy a permanent resident status in Israel, Palestinians in Area C do not enjoy the same kind of status. They don't have a, any legal status at all other than being Palestinian. Uh, in both areas, uh, while the PA um, is not allowed to operate, Israel has been simultaneously neglecting the dire need of the Palestinian populations in these zones. So, for instance, in Jerusalem, a group of Palestinians in collaboration with the PA worked on operating a clinic. This was then forcibly closed by Israel because the PA is again prohibited from operating in East Jerusalem. Israel destroyed a testing center set up by Palestinians last month because it was labeled a collaboration with the PA. The Palestinian governor of Jerusalem was detained by Israel's police on charges of collaborating with the PA to fight COVID-19 in the city. Uh, similarly, Israel confiscated tents, uh, around six tents in the Jordan Valley area dedicated to fight COVID-19. Two of them were uh, designated to form a clinic and four were made for residents evacuated from their homes. The fifth system is basically for Palestinians in uh, the West Bank in areas A and B. In those areas, the PA has been going to great lengths to prevent the spread of the virus in its early stages, including uh, 
imposing a lockdown and a state of emergency as soon as around uh, a handful of cases emerged in Bethlehem on March 5th, 2020. Uh, the PA established regular information channels with the population through different uh, ministries. They hold basically uh, news conferences and regular updates on a daily basis on the situation. However, the main problem of the PA in area A and, and B has been the lack of control over borders. It's uh, controlled entirely by Israel. So in that sense, most prominently Palestinian workers, hundreds of thousands who uh, labor in Israel, were going in and out of the occupied territories without being tested by Israel or provided with basic health services. In one instance, a Palestinian laborer fell unconscious during war, so the Israeli army had to transport him to the nearest checkpoint in the territories and abandon him there without any medical care. The PA, although it managed to contain the virus for a, little, a relatively long period of time, now they are facing a second wave of the virus, a more aggressive one. This comes amidst a giant financial crisis for the PA, where its revenues are expected to drop by around 40% due to the coronavirus. This would significantly impact the population because poverty means living conditions are unhealthy, unsanitary, overcrowded, lack of access to clean water or adequate uh, food. In addition to the inability or devastated purchasing power in terms of buying disinfectants or protective equipment such as gloves or masks. The poverty rates in the occupied territories are already alarming as they are. It stands currently at 53% in the Gaza Strip, at 14% in the West Bank, and 76% in East Jerusalem. Finally, the sixth and most alarming system is the Gaza Strip under Israel's control. The small enclave of 2 million inhabitants has been under Israeli naval, aerial, and ground uh, lockdown since 2007. This means that life is adjusted in Gaza to, uh, according to what Israel allows in or out. Gazan exports are restricted to what Israel considers a humanitarian necessity, whereas its exports have been virtually banned as long as the blockade goes. One example to understand the depths of Israel's blockade is that last February, Israel imposed a blanket ban on communication equipment such as cell phones, computers, internet routers, etc. This came as a response because a storage facility for the Palestinian telecommunication company Paltel in Gaza was robbed. So Israel said that we would remove the ban if the robbery case is handled appropriately by local authorities. So it goes to that level of micromanagement. Israel deals with Gaza's needs on a basis of public relations campaign. So in February 2019, Israeli defense official presented an assessment to the Israeli security cabinet saying that uh, Gaza's collapsing and compromised health sector would, quote, make it difficult for the Israeli army to fight in the Strip for long and could lead to intense international intervention. Similarly, Israeli officials warned in March this year that it would be unspinnable in terms of public relations if Gaza experiences an outbreak of COVID-19 and Gazans turn to the separation fence to demand medical treatment in Israel and the army shoots them as has been the case with the Great Return March over the last two years. Uh, since the virus showed up in Gaza in April, Israel has shown it uh, the minimal amount of responsibility necessary to assuage, let's say, international concerns. It allowed at the beginning 200 testing kits from w, uh, the WHO and it trained 20 uh, medical doctors, Palestinians from Gaza in Israel on how to prevent the virus rather than how to treat it. There has been, however, a breakthrough in Israel's relationship with Gaza during the virus. For instance, Israel has been using Gaza as a backyard factory for masks and protective gear. Israel exceptionally allowed fabrics and necessary raw materials to Gaza to produce millions of masks and PPE from Gazan factories to go to Israeli markets. Uh, Israel has also been outsourcing Gaza's responsibilities to other countries like the state of Qatar. Uh, last February, it's been declassified that Israel's chief of Mossad, Yossi Cohen, 
visited Qatar to ask its government to maintain cash flows to Gaza and Hamas. So in terms of the local authority abandoned that way, how they handle the virus, the most focus has been on the preventative rather than the curative measures. They closed down places of public gathering and uh, built uh, primitive quarantine areas then schools and hospitals into quarantine zones as well. There's been so far around 70 patients in Gaza, all in quarantine zones, but no outbreak amongst the population. Nonetheless, the WHO has warned that it would be inevitable for an outbreak of COVID-19 in Gaza. Many factors render this scenario an absolute catastrophe. First, Gaza's high population density and high unemployment rates render it impossible to take precautionary measures against the virus, such as social distancing and purchasing power to buy protective equipment. The second factor is weakened collective immunity of the population by factors like water contamination. It currently exceeds 97%. For instance, anemia and nutritional deficiencies such as vitamin A and D are high amongst Gazan children and youth due to diarrheal infections linked to lack of access to clean water. The third factor and the final factor is Gaza's compromised health sector. It's critically unprepared to treat patients infected with the virus as it's already at a breaking point. There are around 60 ventilators in Gaza, most of which are already occupied. Uh, the Ministry of Health indicated that 25% of medical consumables, 65% of laboratory supplies, and 43% of essential medicine have been consumed already. So to conclude, it's inability to lock down, higher exposure to risk, and lack of preparedness to treat patients. Without a dramatic and substantial change in Israel's relationship with Gaza, I think the, an outbreak, an inevitable outbreak of COVID-19 would be dooming the population and sentencing them to death. And thank you. Thank you so much, Mohammed, for your presentation. And thank you to Karim and Jam as well for your presentations. Um, so now we will open to a question and answers. So if you can please write your questions in the Q&A section instead of using a chat. Um, in the Q&A section, and then we will address those questions. Um, Haim, do you want to, do we have any questions yeah. already? Do you want to go? Yeah, we already have uh, several questions. I will start with specific questions to each case uh, posed by uh, Nikami uh, Anim. Uh, the first one, uh, what is the status of Somal Somaliland's recognition in terms of a relationship with the WHO? This is for JAMA. By extension, how does Somaliland acquire essential medical equipment such as uh, respirators in these circumstances? So this question is for JAMA. There is a question to Karim. Uh, as what we might describe as a de facto occupier of Northwest Syria, what has been the role of Turkey in providing medical help for testing or treatment? And finally, a question to Muhammad. Um, is the PA's decision to reject aid from UAE sent via Israel a political own goal given the level of the emergency? Let's start with Jama. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you. Um, the question uh, is uh, the answer is no. WHO does not recognize uh, uh, Somaliland, so there is no seat of Somaliland for the WHO. Uh, but the second uh, question has, uh, gives me the opportunity to, uh, uh, to, to yes, uh, coronavirus brings problems, but also brings some opportunities and in, in an in a unrecognized state. Uh, and uh, because, of, of course, it puts uh, a lot of demand on the meager resources uh, that they have. Uh, so uh, as uh, Karim was saying, the mega resources that you have, you deal with uh, what you have in hand. So that's uh, uh, paradoxically, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's a positive thing that people reflect on what they have. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, it brings the other opportunity to uh, put itself as an invisible state, become immediately visible because of there is a, there is a, a lot of this. But Somaliland, uh, and, 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 and probably it's linked also the question that has been asked to, to Muhammad. As uh, for instance, uh, um, 
uh, an example is the Chinese billionaire and founder of Alibaba, uh, Jack, uh, Jack Ma, whose donation to African nations through African Union and the Ethiopian government uh, uh, has basically go into the to Mogadishu, to Federal Republic, Federal, federal uh, Somali Federal Government. And Somaliland refused to get that support if it was not direct support uh, to Somaliland. So uh, that, that, that is a quite refusing, it's also a political way to show I'm here and I need the support because of it's emergency, so I wanted to deal directly. with. But uh, in this period, uh, Somaliland also um, uh, found uh, threatened uh, uh, some friendship uh, and new allies, uh, friendly countries, uh, especially for example, United uh, Arab of Emirates, which has supported Somaliland with materials, uh, and Ethiopia with small support, but direct support. Uh, um, so it allows also Somaliland to enhance its relation with Ethiopia. Uh, for example, Ethiopian Airlines continue to fly, it, even though the Somalia uh, uh, government has objected to this, uh, but uh, uh, still the, the, the flight was coming. It was a direct support uh, and show the, 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 the current situation. Uh, so Somaliland was getting and is still getting this support on a humanitarian, in humanitarian uh, channels uh, and it's getting support to small, smaller sizes what, for what needed, but it is still getting from, the, from different countries. One last thing is that uh, Somaliland mobilized uh, mainly the diaspora people, but also all its own resources and even the private sector supported, uh, collected money, went to buy uh, materials that was needed, uh, and since in the country, the healthcare was not uh, any way to answer, to, to give an answer, they, uh, Somaliland used what it has in it is, uh, within its uh, 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 power, which is, it in, it is, it is. So it was uh, uh, coming in the humanitarian aspect that was coming even before, the, as a Somaliland there was not recognized and still not recognized, but also it showed the necessity of the sort of uh, 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 the state that should count of what they have through the diaspora, or most importantly, what they have locally in that. So that was the way the Somaliland were get, getting support uh, from outside. Thank you, Jama. Uh, let's move now to Karim, and there was a question about the support from Turkey. Uh, so here maybe there are two elements to uh, to answer this question. The first one is related to the geopolitics about the Turkish involvement in northern northern Syria. Um, so as uh, you know, there there have been two uh, major military operations by Turkey. The first one was in northern Syria. The first one is the Olive Branch operation, which was in northwest, and the second one is called the Peace Spring operation, which is in the northeast. So in these territories, uh, currently there is. Um, active Turkish presence with active uh, involvement of the Turkish institutions. For example, the Ministry of Health, the Turkish Ministry of Health, they operate in these areas, but not in all opposition controlled areas. So there are still areas in northwest of Syria, which is mainly Idlib uh, government rate, that is not under the Turkish um, management, but still there are Turkish presence in terms of army. And in the, recent, uh, in the recent months, between December and March, because of the escalated tension and the offensive by the same regime, there have been a lot of regional um, uh, maneuvers, let's say, uh, that, uh, that pushed Turkey to go inside uh, Syria. And they now they control the, the whole region, but without actual management. So there's still, for example, in Idlib government rate, the Idlib health act rate, they are the local health authority, and there is no involvement from the, from the Turkish Minister of Health. Whereas in the other regions of the Olive Branch and the, the Peace Spring operations, the Turkish Minister of Health, they are the sole uh, let's say uh, overseeing, like uh, overseeing the whole health sector. And here we need to talk about the different surveillance system in terms of how to detect. So before 2019, there have been two main uh, surveillance systems in Syria. The first one that is run by the Ministry of Health in Damascus, which is called the Early Warning and Response System, EWARS. And this is supported by the WHO from Damascus. So it covers mainly the regime, the government of Syria controlled areas. And the second one is called the Early Warning and Response Network, the EWARN, 
which is run by a Syrian NGO called the Assistance Coordination Unit. And it's also supported unofficially, let's say, by the WHO, and it covers areas controlled by oppositions. And the main problems here that neither of the system, the surveillance system, cover first the northeast of Syria, which is under the self-administration, the, the Kurdish areas, and the areas controlled uh, by, the, by the Turks uh, currently. So these areas, there, there, was, there was a need to establish new surveillance system. So the Turkish Ministry of Health in these areas, they established their surveillance system, the self-administration in the Northeast. They have a very, um, uh, let's say, initial and, uh, surveillance system that was designed mainly to deal with the COVID-19 response. But in terms of the Turkish presence in Idlib governorate in Northwest of Syria, I think uh, rather than you know, providing help, I think it's, it's represent a threat. For this, for this region. Why? Because I'm talking here mainly about COVID-19. I'm not you know, an expert in geopolitics, but in terms of health, this area, northwest of Syria, is naturally isolated. And this might be the factor that puts this area in a more protective um, you know, uh, level compared to other regions in Syria. Until this, this time, until this point, there has been no confirmed cases in northwest of Syria. And the reason might be that this area is, is isolated. So the borders were closed. And also the, the, the passenger movements, even when the border was open, the passenger movements is very, very limited. Only, you know, a few, like uh, tens of people every day. So, but the Turkish presence, the having, you know, more than 15,000 Turkish soldiers in this region with an open border between Turkey and this region represent a, a threat. So currently, the, um, some local health authorities in Idlib, they advise people not to interact with the Turkish uh, soldiers in Idlib because we do not know, you know the, the uh, contact tracing, for example, or the travel history of those, of those, uh, uh, of those soldiers. But from a more kind of uh, positive um, point of view in terms of the COVID-19 impact on this region, again, the, I think the COVID-19 pandemic has helped in freezing the front lines in northwest of Syria because there was a lot of tension and also the, the for example, the, Turk, the Turks were threatening the Syrian regime and the Syrian regime were threatening of attacking the whole region. But I think this has um, scaled down. Maybe like one factor I'm not trying to attribute here, but in terms of timing, this happened mainly in, in March and April. So it might be that COVID-19 has pushed mainly the Russians and the Turks to reduce hostilities in this region. Great, many, many thanks, Karim. And now let's move to the question uh, of to Muhammad. Yeah. Sure, uh, thanks, Nick, for your question. In terms of the Emirati aid to Palestine, it was two instances of Emirati flights landing in Ben Gurion Airport in Israel carrying uh, medical aid to the occupied territories. Um, not, the UAE has not revealed the motivation for such action. However, both Israelis and Palestinians have uh, grossly politicized this move for the Israeli government, Danny Danon Netanyahu, and several officials have celebrated it as a, a historic milestone in which Israel's relationship with the Arab world is improving, and here's the evidence of flight landing in Ben Gurion Airport from an Arab country. For the Palestinian Authority and the Palestinian public, it was widely frowned upon as an act of corona washing uh, Israeli Arab normalization. So the Palestinian Authority's objection was primarily based on that this has not been coordinated with uh, either the PA or they have not been informed about it at all. They learned about it from media as it landed. In my opinion, I think it's been a mistake to refuse it at this moment of emergency. However, the question is a question of um, adequacy. Would it be enough to accept symbolic amounts of ventilators and medical aid to tackle the issue? Or would it be an act of, again, corona washing the situation? And in that sense, the primary problem here has been, for instance, the issue with movement restrictions or Israel's uh, undermining the PA from operating in areas like East Jerusalem and uh, Area C. In addition to issues of water contamination, a lack of access to uh, adequate medical services, 
uh, Palestinians in Area C, they are provided only with 20% of the water in the area. Uh, about 3% of Palestinian construction in Area C is approved. In Jerusalem, only 13% of East Jerusalem is designated for Palestinian construction, which is already overly populated. So it's an issue of overpopulation, uh, weakened immunity system, collective immunity, unpreparedness in terms of the medical sector. And for that, uh, it's an issue of whether they should have accepted a symbolic corona washing or not, as they have viewed it themselves. Thank you. Many, many thanks, uh, Muhammad. We have two last questions, maybe. If we're lucky, maybe we'll have some space for another one. Uh, one question from uh, Ahmed Abdi is, uh, how much impact would, uh, sorry, how much impact would the lack of recognition have on the ability to manage local settlements for the future planning regarding the pandemic scenario like COVID-19 in each case? So this question, uh, each of you should answer shortly, I hope so. Uh, the other question is from Bruce Stanley. Hello, Bruce. Uh, it's a question to Karim and Muhammad. Uh, do you see differences in the way municipal authorities are handling their local crisis, with some being more supportive of local initiatives or more creative than others. So let's start now with Muhammad and then we'll move to Jama and Karim. Thank you very much. So in terms of municipalities, in the West Bank, municipalities have been playing a very central role in terms of imposing lockdowns and uh, quarantine measures and providing public sterilization and disinfectant campaigns. In the Gaza Strip, uh, the local municipalities have been also trying to uh, at least do the maximum they could within their limited capacity in terms of sterilization and disinfectant campaigns. However, in the Gaza Strip, um, municipalities have declared reducing their services to the local population significantly due to the financial impact of the coronavirus. So this becomes a question of whether municipalities would be functional uh, the more we go on with this situation. It's further exacerbated now with Israel and the Palestinian Authority's uh, latest uh, turmoil in which the PA is refusing to take tax monies from Israel as Israel is conditioning that they should sit with them in the midst of cutting relations. Uh, as for uh, the impact of lack of recognition on the ability to manage local settlements, in terms of the, the West Bank, the matter all comes down to whether Israel would allow the Palestinian Authority uh, the ability to manage its own borders in uh, the West Bank. In the Gaza Strip, it's a matter of Israel, would it allow Gaza unrestricted or let's say a more meaningful access to the world in order to uh, import necessary equipment to fight the virus for instance ventilators uh, fix local uh, medical machines that have been as old as the blockade is or other issues for instance uh, with hydroxytroxide israel has been restricting certain concentrations of it hydroxytroxide is necessary to make disinfectants so local manufacturers resorted to using acetone in order to make disinfectants with lower concentrations are not as effective. So it's first and last a matter of tackling the relationship between the occupied and occupied. Thank you. Thanks, Muhammad. Jama? Um, well, in the case of Somaliland, uh, first of all, the, local, the, the, the recognized counterpart uh, uh, of Somaliland has no power and interference at all at the um, local <coughs> settlements. Or, or, so nothing will change uh, about with the coronavirus. Uh, uh, Somaliland used it to manage uh, um, independently its own internal set, uh, 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 territory. So that will not have an impact. But what uh, came out uh, as a experience, as a lesson is learned, uh, uh, for a non-recognized country is that uh, to look for an alternative strategy, some partnership uh, relying, for example, on the local community. I think that came out strongly. The second thing is a questioning at all about the uh, aid. It's aid coming, aid coming from uh, outside 
is, uh, you know, we are talking about uh, the politicizing the aid. So probably we will be opening a new chapter and the world should deal when it comes to the, to the, to the aid. The last thing is that uh, um, the, the strategies uh, in the future, I think, will be strengthening still on the private, uh, private sector, on the diaspora, and what the, each uh, country state can do by itself. So that's what's coming out uh, as a future planning uh, in the uh, regarding pandemic uh, uh, scenario, like the one that we are just uh, passing over. Kareem, please. Yeah, I would share very similar views to what uh, Gemma has mentioned uh, about the, um, the new realities that the COVID-19 pandemic is imposing, that uh, the, the humanitarian system should rethink about, you know, reforms needed on how to engage in not only unrecognized states, but non-state lands. For example, the northwest of Syria, I would consider it as non-state lands. For example, compared to the northeast, Yes, Northeast, there is one central uh, government, which is the self-administration. But in Northwest, there is lit literally no government. There are, you know, uh, different actors, diverse actors. So first, the humanitarian um, system needs to rethink how to engage with these actors. And I think one strategy is that should be explored. Uh, and I think that there is, there is a literature from Afghanistan, from various places on how to uh, think about local engagement rather than central uh, big engagements. Because for example, I, in, in the COVID-19 response, uh, it's proved that rather than engaging, in, for example, in only with the central government in, in a place, uh, then think about engaging with different local, uh, maybe uh, actors, unusual actors that might have access and might have influence in certain regions. So we need to uh, shift maybe away from central uh, big investments to more kind of local, uh, more gradual and incremental uh, investments. And I think this has proven to, to work, for example, for the experience of the World Bank in Afghanistan, and it is proposed to be um, a, a strategy to bridge the gap between humanitarian and development in, in Syria. And this goes to the question about municipalities. I think here uh, in non-state um, places, there are unusual actors that might not follow the uh, similar hierarchy that we use to deal with um, in, in normal settings. In Syria, for example, new uh, local authorities emerged. Some of them are only technical local uh, authorities. For example, the health department in the uh, self-administration or the Idlib Health Act rate. And some of them are more local level, for example, the local councils in each single village. And the way each um, entity is activated depends on opportunities and depends on international engagement. Um, so I think yeah, reforms are needed and more kind of local incremental approach uh, is needed. Um, thank you so much. Uh, we only have a few minutes. Um, I think I'll give uh, presenters, the panelists, a minute each to wrap up your session, if you like. Um, so if we start with uh, Jama, you have about a minute to just wrap up your discussion, and then we'll yeah. go to Kareem and then to Mohammed. Yeah, uh, I think uh, the pandemic has brought uh, Somaliland uh, into the international arena. And I think that's the one thing to, 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 to note. And particularly for now as a research study to understand how on earth they are dealing with this uh, crisis if there is no direct connection and support. Um, but I think there is a similarities with Taiwan. Uh, it is just an announcement of yesterday that the government of Taiwan supported Somaliland and, 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 and supported uh, with the medical supply and, and, and uh, but it started a new way of uh, dealing with new friends, which I'm sure will continue post-COVID uh, in a political uh, 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 direction. So I think that is, uh, in my conclusion, what we are uh, seeing here and observing here from Hargeisa is that uh, this was uh, to showcase uh, the Somaliland uh, quest for recognition as well, not only the problem of health that are in common with uh, the rest of the world. Uh, for me, um, in less than a minute, uh, I think the COVID-19 response in Syria has showed the, uh, demonstrated the importance of investing in local resources. 
where the international uh, assistance might arrive late, uh, which has been the case in, in various outbreaks uh, in, 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 the, in the recent decades. Uh, second, uh, if, uh, especially in the, in the states of unrecognition, uh, in the, uh, I mean, a bottom-up governance systems should be explored and should be supported and invested to, uh, in to, to uh, mobilize resources. And also lastly, innovative approaches uh, need to be tested. Uh, the use of digital solutions, technology, and these sorts of solutions that sometimes might not be um, an option for actors thinking of conflict settings or um, states where uh, non-state uh, areas. So I think, uh, yes, these options need to be explored. And lastly, the need for uh, reforms in the humanitarian system to uh, deal in conf to deal with complex settings uh, rather than relying on uh, internationally recognized states and governments engaging with more a wider group of uh, actors uh, and bottom up governance systems uh, for me to conclude I think the issue of non recognition and how it's going to be shaped for corona it's already been tackled more, most prominently in Israel's relation with the Gaza Strip. I mentioned the example of Hamas's Ministry of Health sending 20 medical doctors to be trained inside Israel by Israeli medical mm -hmm. doctors. This is unprecedented. Another issue is how Israel is buying masks, millions of masks from Gaza for protection. The factory owner was saying that two years ago they were killing us. Now uh, they want us to save their lives. But um, What's important is to build on these uh, horizons of collaboration and expand them further. So, for instance, it's not just coronavirus. In Gaza, uh, bacterial infections have been developing a stronger resistance to antibiotics. This can be spread to Israel as well. It's inescapable. The same issue goes to water contamination. It's been spreading to Israeli beaches as well. So, it's, it, the non-recognition is no longer um, efficient. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mohammed, And thank you to all the panelists for joining us today. And thank you to all of you for also joining um, the discussion. So just to wrap it up, again, we see these countries or these regions face similar but yet different challenges. Um, some of these challenges, of course, are not new, um, but perhaps they've been exacerbated by the current pandemic. But again, uh, we also see, see some interesting innovation taking place as a result of this pandemic. So I wanted to just um, thank you all uh, for being with us today. And yeah, I hope you can carry on this discussion and um, we will see you all next time. Thank you very much for joining us.